presentation this morning is on the ABCs of understanding your emotions. I hope you all have a lesson guide here. Now, how many of you this morning came with somebody that you know? Anybody here? Now, I want you to turn to that person that you came with that you know. I want you to say, you need to listen to this guy this morning because he's a pastor. Hear that? <laughs> Tell him, you need to pay attention. You need to listen to what is being shared here this morning. Now, during this week-long seminar, you know, I don't want to leave anybody, anybody with the impression that a 30-minute lecture can remove all of the challenges that you might be facing in life. My goal is to share with you the major principles, taking very broad brushstrokes, on, on how you can change and improve the major areas of one's life. Now, for some of you, and you don't need to raise your hand for this, um, but for some of us here in this room or maybe watching online, you know, things like anxiety and depression, we're going to be talking about that this coming Friday night. We're going to talk about what causes depression um, and how, what does it feel like to have depression and what are the best ways to treat depression. But I want you to know that if you've struggled with anxiety or depression, that, you know, first of all, you're not a second-class citizen, Right. And if anybody in here this morning, or those of you watching, if you're taking any kind of medication now for depression or anxiety, don't ever stop taking any medication without consulting your doctor first, right? My attorney told me I'm supposed to make that announcement. Probably should have mentioned it last night. So don't ever stop taking any medication unless you first consult with your primary care physician. But you know, for some people, they think because they have anxiety and or depression and some can have both. There's a difference between the two. But they think, you know, I'm a believer or I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Christian. I shouldn't be struggling with this. But the reality is some people do. And so whether you're a believer or not, you are not immune to the effects of anxiety or depression. But I want you to know that you are not a second-class citizen, all right? If you're seeing a therapist or a counselor, that's okay. That's very good. If you're taking medication, there's nothing wrong with that, all right? Because a part of God's healing, sometimes God can heal people just through a miracle. We see the examples of that in the Bible. We perhaps have seen examples of that in, in our life. But there's other ways that God can heal people, and sometimes that's through medicine. Sometimes that's through counseling or therapy. Other times that's through talking with and seeing your primary care physician. So, just to reiterate, you are not a second-class citizen if you don't have everything in your life all together. In fact, we learned last night that nobody has it all together, right? Every single person I meet, we all have, including myself, at least one area in our life that is messed up and that we need to work on improving. Now, this morning, I'm going to talk about the ABCs of emotional health, because all of us can benefit when it comes to controlling one's emotions. So I want you to ask yourself this rhetorical question, what do you want out of life? What do you want out of life? Now, some will tell you that, you know, what they want is they want to be good looking, right? Or better yet, they want to be good looking and have a lot of money. Or maybe you want to have a new car, or, or maybe you want to find that certain somebody, right? That, that relationship. Well, when you think about it, it's really not these things that we want, but rather it's the good feelings that these things bring us. That's what we're ultimately after. For example, how many of you know by a show of hands, how many of you know that being good looking has brought you personal happiness? Let me see your hand. <laughs> Yeah, you got a couple people raise their hands. Hey, our camera guy raised his hand just, oh no, he's adjusting the camera. Oh yeah, he's, he's okay, oh yeah. You know, there's a reason, now I've got a, I've got a couple of cars. Both of my cars um, have a sunroof because what brings me happiness is driving on a beautiful day like today with my sunroof open because I want to feel the wind through my hair. You know what I mean? You know what I mean, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. But, you know, ultimately, what people are after in life is they're after happiness. They're after, they're after happiness and contentment. Now, here's an important principle that we're going to learn today. You may want to write this down. 
How you feel at any given time is the result of how you are choosing to feel at that time. How you feel at any given time is how you are choosing to feel at that given moment. You know, one of the most important things that anybody can learn in life is how to manage their state of emotions. Did you know that 70 to 80% of your thought life, that's that, 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 that silent self-talk, 70 to 80% of your thought life, your silent self-talk, is either in the past or you're focusing on the future. Did you know that? Most people either focus on the past or they focus on the future rather than focusing on the present moment. In fact, notice this Chinese proverb. It says, control your emotions or they will what? You. I bless my kids all the time. Control your emotions or your emotions will control you. Now, I hope last night when you heard about the homework assignment, and the homework assignment last night, there was two of them. Number one was to begin reading the book of Proverbs. I hope you read between last night and this morning. I hope you read Proverbs chapter 1. Then it's also to wake up in the morning, and before you do anything, except maybe, you know, back and that's fine, is think of something that you're grateful for, right? You want to have that attitude of gratitude. But notice how the book of Proverbs puts this. Uh, Solomon wrote, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Managing to control your emotions will give you one of the greatest advantages in life. In fact, it'll help you live a truly happy and content life. Now, the opposite is also true. If you do not know how to manage or control your emotions, you are going to experience things like anger and sadness and anxiety, and it will also sadly bring fear into your life. You know, Thomas Jefferson said, nothing gives one so much advantage over another than to remain calm and unruffled under all Again, learning to control your emotions will give you one of the greatest advantages in life. Now, how many of you, by a show of hands, have ever heard the term emotional intelligence? You've heard that term before? Emotional intelligence. Now, emotional intelligence is really something they ought to start teaching kids when they're in kindergarten. I mean, and, and, and as much time as our kids in schools spend in math and reading and science, which are important, I believe they should spend just as much time studying the topic of emotional intelligence. Now, emotional intelligence refers to the ability to identify and manage one's emotions as well as the emotions in others. In fact, there are five abilities that comprise one's emotional intelligence. So we're on page one. If you weren't here last night, Anytime you see a word that is highlighted, either blue or yellow, um, and I chose the color blue or yellow depending on the background, nothing is worse than putting a yellow highlighted word on a white background, all right? It's nearly impossible to read. And so here's the five abilities that comprise your emotional intelligence. Number one is knowing our emotions. So what you want to do in our number one there is just write the word in knowing our emotions. Number two is managing our emotions. So again, you'll want to write the word managing there. Managing our emotions. Number three is recognizing the emotions in others. I should have asked, does everybody have a lesson guide in a Something uh, like a writing apparatus, something to write with. You all have that? Number three, recognizing emotions in others. Number four, managing relationships with others. In fact, tonight we have a whole night, we're going to talk, or a whole presentation, we're going to talk about um, how to build and maintain healthy relationships, how to avoid toxic relationships. And number five, motivating ourselves to achieve our goals. Now, your emotional intelligence, sometimes it's called EQ, will contribute more to a successful and enjoyable life than your general intelligence, all right? 
Emotional intelligence will contribute more to an enjoyable and successful life than one's general intelligence. Now, here's the good news. Emotional intelligence can be learned and it can be improved upon, right? It's not just inherited. It can actually be learned and improved upon if you're willing to follow certain steps. So please know, again, there is a difference between one's emotional intelligence and one's intelligent quotient or IQ. There's a difference between EQ, emotional intelligence, and IQ, your intelligent quote. Here's, here's the difference. So your IQ will determine what type of career you have. Typically, your IQ will determine what type of career you go into. Whereas your EQ or your emotional intelligence will determine how far you go in that career. In other words, the smartest person doesn't always get the big promotion, but rather it's the individual with the highest level of emotional intelligence. They're the ones that get the promotion. You see, all of us have worked with people, and I won't say any names, but I've worked with people that are much, much smarter than I am. In fact, I'm thinking of one person in particular. I no longer work with this person, but they are one of the smartest people I've ever known. But they're also one of the most difficult people to work with I've ever known. So this individual has very high IQ, but they have very low emotional intelligence to the point where not only does nobody want to work for them, but they're never going to get promoted to a level within management. It's not because they're not smart. They're extremely smart because they have very low emotional. Does that make sense? Yes or no? So that's really the difference here between uh, the two. And again, emotional intelligence is about how to manage you know, relationships with other people. And life is all about relationships. In fact, notice this quote from a Greek philosopher who lived like 2,000 years ago. He said, people are not disturbed by things, but by the view they take of them. People are not disturbed by things, but by the view that they take of them. Now, your emotional upsetness, this is at the top of page two, is caused largely, anytime you feel upset, you feel upset because of two things. Number one, your beliefs. And number two, your silent self-talk statements about that situation. And so there at the top of page two, it says our emotional turmoil is primarily caused by two things. Those two things are number one, your beliefs. And number two, your silent self-talk statements. It's really your beliefs and what you're telling yourself about that event or situation. That is what gets you frustrated much more than the actual situation itself, right? So it's not the situation that's going to aggravate you, but it's actually what you're telling yourself and your beliefs about that situation. Now, when it comes to your beliefs, always let the Bible be the source and reference for what is true, right? I take the position that there is an absolute truth in the universe, and that absolute truth can be found in the Bible. Always let the Bible be the source of truth. In fact, notice what Jesus says here in Mark 9, 23. Jesus said to him, if you can what? Believe all things are possible to him who believes. And that believing starts in your what? So one of the things when it comes to having high emotional intelligence is you want to tell yourself, you want to, your silent self-talk, your beliefs must be founded in truth. It must be founded in what, everybody? Truth. truth. You have to tell yourself truthful statements. Now, let me share with you um, an example of... Um, of these two brothers, all right? This will help kind of spell it out here. So there's these two brothers that were born 11 months apart. And these two brothers, they, I'm going to give you an example here about how your beliefs impact your life. So these two brothers, they were born 11 months apart, and they grew up in the exact same environment, all right? 
Their dad was an alcoholic, he was a drug addict, and he ended up in jail. So two brothers born 11 months apart, same environment, their dad is a drug addict, and their mom was nowhere to be seen, and he was an alcoholic, and he goes to jail. Now, sadly, one of the brothers followed his dad's footsteps, while the other brother started a successful business. Now, both brothers were asked the same question in an interview. The question they were asked is, why has your life turned out the way that it did? And the answer that the two boys gave was amazing in that they both gave the same answer. Both brothers said, what else could I have become having grown up with a father? Now think about this. Both brothers grew up in a very dysfunctional environment. One followed the dad's footsteps. The other made a very successful life for himself. And they were both asked the same question, why did your life turn out the way it did? And they both gave what? The same answer. What do you mean? How else would my life have turned out? You see, one of the boys looked at the situation and he said, I want to make my life a success and I don't want to be like my dad. Whereas the other brother told himself, the other brother looked at this situation and he said, well, you know, this is how my dad is, so I guess this is what I'm going to end up being too. Their beliefs change the kind of people that they would become. And so your beliefs are what start right here, and it's that silent self-talk that we tell ourselves. Our beliefs can be fine in our silent self-talk. So let me ask you, what are you telling yourself? I just did this series down south a month ago, and a lady was coming out, and she told me that she always talks down to herself. Whenever she does something that's kind of foolish or dumb, she'll out loud, she'll call herself stupid. And I told her, you got to quit doing that. Because not only are you thinking it, but now you're verbalizing it, which leaves an even stronger impression upon your life. And so ask yourself, what am I telling myself in my mind? What are the thoughts? What are the beliefs that you're telling yourself about you? Now, I'm going to illustrate how this works, and I want to take you through what's called the ABCs of our emotions, all right? So right there in the middle of page two, A stands for the activating event, right? So A stands for, and you're going to want to write in the activating event, A, B, C, ABCs of your emotions. Now, the activating event, this is what activates or stimulates or awakens your thinking, right? That's the activating event. Now, uh, activating events can be a number of different things. For example, an activating event can be a current stressor in your life. An activating event can be past, present, or future. That means you're anticipating something good or something bad may happen. An activating event can be real. It can be imagined. What about that? An activating event, it can be, oh, let me go back. It can be a single isolated situation or a continual unpleasant situation. And an activating event can be bad events that did occur or good events that did not occur. So these are all examples of activating events. That's what stimulates the thoughts going on in our brain. Now, B, B stands for your beliefs or your silent self-talk statements that we tell ourselves about that activating event. You see, when an activating event takes place, I went through that list of samples of activating events, there are two types of beliefs in your self-talk that are going to take place. There's two types of beliefs, all right? And first, there's what's called irrational beliefs. So there's an activating event. You have this belief, your silent self-talk, you can either have an irrational event, and this is the self-talk that's self-harming, like that lady who said, stupid, call herself stupid. This was an irrational belief, and it's self-harming, it's self-defeating, it's maladaptive, and it creates emotional upsetness. Irrational beliefs are what lead to anxiety, anger, depression, and not having control of one's emotions. Those with low levels of emotional intelligence are going to struggle the most with irrational. Right? 
Now, I'm doing a, I'm going to show you some examples here in a moment of irrational belief. But we are through week two of a nine-week seminar I'm doing down in Federal Way on depression and anxiety. And as a part of that, we actually take all of our, our students. We've got 23 people from, uh, actually we've got about, close to about 30 total attendants in this class. And we take them through a depression as anxiety assessment test. And it not only shows them their level of depression and anxiety, but it shows them what level of emotional intelligence. And a lot of times what people do is they take that test at the very beginning of the nine weeks, and they're not really happy with their test scores. But as they go through the program and they begin to change not only the way they're thinking, but they begin to change certain life patterns and habits in their life, they take the test again at the end of the nine weeks, and they're amazed at how much their emotional intelligence has improved. And again, the good news is you can improve one's emotional intelligence. So first, there's irrational beliefs. And again, those who have irrational beliefs tend to have low emotional intelligence. Second, there are rational beliefs. Now, these are the self-helping, coping, and adaptive statements that lead to emotional health. Rational beliefs lead to less disturbing emotions, and they help us cope more effectively and gain more contentment. Now, those that have high levels of emotional intelligence, they're the ones who are going to have rational beliefs. And again, the good news is emotional intelligence can be improved. Now, C stands for consequences. These are the consequences of your beliefs and your self-talk statements. Now, please, don't forget this point. In fact, you may want to write this down. Our emotions and behaviors are the consequences of our beliefs and self-talk. How you feel at any given moment is based upon your beliefs and your silent self-talk. What is it that you're telling yourself, all right? Now, if your beliefs and self-talk are irrational, well, you're going to be filled with negative emotions. You know, things like uh, anxiety, anger, depression. However, if your beliefs or your silent self-talk is rational, you are going to have positive emotions such as contentment and happiness. Your beliefs and self-talk will determine how you feel or respond to any given situation. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever experienced or seen somebody in road rage, yes or no? Maybe in person or on the news or like on a YouTube video, you've seen uh, road rage. When you see people involved in road rage or if you yourself have been involved in road rage, that is a sign of somebody who has very low emotion. Right? You know, when that person cuts you off on the freeway, frustrating. Nobody likes to get cut off. I mean, there's only limited space between you and the car in front of you. You don't want to ride their rear end because if they hit their brakes, you need time to stop. And there's always that car, right? There's not enough room, but what do they do? Push their way in, right? And obviously that person, I don't know who they are, I don't know their story, but if you respond by, you know, getting on their tail and being angry and, and acting irrational, you are demonstrating a person's no emotional intelligence. But if you say to yourself, you know what, that person's in a hurry, they're a rude driver, whatever, and you let it go, you are now practicing rational beliefs, which means you have higher levels of emotional intelligence, and you're not going to have the same level of anxiety or anger or frustration that's going to carry with you through the day every time you think about that rude driver. Instead, you're practicing rational thoughts, and you're only going to have mild annoyance, but eventually what you'll experience is contentment and happiness. So notice that when you're on the road next time, you'll see people who have very low emotional intelligence. Again, your beliefs and your self-talk will determine how you feel or respond in any given situation. Now, I want to walk you through what happens. I'm going to review what we just learned. So the ABCs of emotions. A, this is your activating event, right? So an activating event can be maybe your spouse, you know, is 
frustrated with you. Or maybe your kids are fighting. If you got young kids, you know young kids fight. Or let's say for this example, your boss criticized you, right? So I'm going to walk you through a scenario. Some of us are retired. Some of us have jobs here. But let's say the activating event in your life is your boss criticizes you. Now, the criticism from your boss is going to trigger your beliefs or your silent self-talk. There's the activating event and your boss criticizes you. This act of nature, belief, your silent self-talk, and what that is, your self-talk, your beliefs are either going to be irrational beliefs or they're going to be rational beliefs. And now if you have irrational beliefs, notice what the consequences are. So again, your boss criticizes you. You're thinking about what your boss said. You're having irrational beliefs. And so the consequences, your emotional and your behaviors, you experience anxiety, anger, and depression because your boss criticized you, because you had irrational beliefs. Now you're thinking thoughts. Well, let's say your boss were to criticize you, and instead of having irrational beliefs, let's say you had rational beliefs. Well, now the consequences are not anger or anxiety, or depression, because you had rational beliefs based upon that activating event, your consequences now is only mild. And again, the good news is emotional intelligence can be improved. And when we have rational beliefs about an activating event, we will have insignificant emotional distress. Now, let me share with you some examples of the most common irrational beliefs that people struggle with, all right? Here's the irrational beliefs that most people struggle with. The first one is, in fact, you're going to see this on page two, one of the most common irrational beliefs that people struggle with. Now, there's more, you know, that I could name, but I'm just going to go through the most common ones here this morning with you for time's sake. So the first one is all or nothing thinking. All or nothing thinking. Now, all or nothing thinking happens when we simplify the world by putting everything into extremes or absolutes. Everything is either black or it's white, it's good or bad, it's up or down. When we get caught in this cycle, those with all or nothing thinking fail to see the vast gray area in which most of life takes place. Now, Dr. Neil Medley, who's a practicing physician, he wrote a book, a number of books. He's a well-known speaker, author. A couple of his books that I've read that I highly endorse. One of them is called Depression, The Way Out. Very good book. But I think my favorite book, in fact, this would be in my probably top five favorite books of all time, is a book called The Lost Art of Thinking. Lost Art of Thinking. Now, it's not a cheap book. Probably about $35, $40, a hardback I've read that book probably three or four times. It's, it's a decent-sized book. Um, it is one of the best books when it comes to emotional intelligence. Now, in this book, he lists the characteristics of all-or-nothing thinkers. So, for example, all-or-nothing thinkers, they have difficulty accepting anything less than be perfection. All or nothing thinkers have unrealistically high expectations of themselves and other people. Whenever we have really high expectations of other people, that individual rarely ever meets our expectations and therefore they let us down. Then we're frustrated or angry or upset with that person. And sometimes it's not always that person's fault it's because we have such high expectations of that person. Those that have all or nothing thinking, they have trouble acknowledging that we all make mistakes and that many things in life are learned through a series of small mistakes. They have the belief that they or others must either uh, must be either a total success or a total failure. That's all or nothing. Of course, there's examples in history, examples in the Bible of people who have all or nothing thinking. Now, unhealthy forms of all-or-nothing thinking are what lead to anxiety, depression, guilt, feelings of in inferiority, anger, and hopelessness. Now, thoughts of suicide, 
Suicide is the ultimate all or nothing. The idea that I'm going to take my life because my life is worthless and, and the world would be better off if I were here. That is an extreme example of all or nothing thinking. Now, you may know somebody or have experienced somebody in your life, and my heart breaks for you, somebody that committed suicide. Sadly, that person, when they committed suicide, they had a very extreme level of all or nothing. They may not have defined it as that, um, but in reality, that's what was going on, all or nothing. Now, not all not <laughs> it's kind of a tongue twister, not all or nothing thinking is bad, right? Sometimes all or nothing thinking is good. For example, when a doctor tells their patient, if you don't stop drinking alcohol, you're going to die. The doctor tells the patient, you need to quit smoking cigarettes. When a doctor tells the patient, you need to lose weight, you're going to die. You know, so not all or nothing thinking is bad. In fact, those who struggle with addictions, they need to be thinking all or nothing. For example, if you ask an ex-smoker, an ex-pornography uh, addict, an ex-gambler, they will tell you all it takes is one cigarette, one soft porn, one lottery ticket. They're back at it again. Those overcoming addictions, they need to think in terms of black or white. Does that make sense? They need to think in terms of black or white, and they need to avoid those gray areas, you know? I know I'm trying to give up gambling. I'm not going to gamble. I'm just going to go socialize at the casino. Not going to happen, right? They're going to end up sitting down at one of those one-armed bandits and probably losing everything. And so one of the ways to overcome unhealthy forms of all-or-nothing thinking is to start thinking in shades of gray, right? If something doesn't work out exactly as you would hope, try thinking of it as a partial success and not a total failure. In fact, here's a couple of examples of things that you can do to help um, that you can tell yourself. Um, instead of saying things like, I can't deal with rejection, you know, say, I don't like rejection, I'm going to get through it. See, it's, it's, it's rephrasing that. You know, instead of saying, I'm a total failure, like that person I said would say, stupid. Well, instead of saying, I'm a total failure, say, you know, I'm reasonably good at something. And all of us here have things in our life that we're no good at, and we all have things in our life that we're good at. It just varies on the you know different people. For example, I am not good at singing. Anybody here in my boat not a good singer? Let me see my non-singer. How many of you like singing? Some of you who said you're not good at singing still like to sing, right? So, <laughs> so it's okay. It's okay to have things in our life that we're not good at. Right? There's other things in life that we can um, excel at. Instead of saying, my spouse always disagrees with me, you can say, we can agree to disagree without endangering. Now, here's another irrational belief. It's called overgeneralizing. Overgeneralizing. Now, overgeneralizers believe that because something bad happened to them once, it will repeatedly happen to them for the rest of their life. Now, very few things in life ever work out just the way we want them to. Now, if you find yourself using words like never, using words like always, then there's a really good chance that you are overgeneralizing. Now, a person that overgeneralizes will remember the day that it rained on their beach vacation, but they'll forget about the six other days that it was sunny and warm. They come back to Hawaii, and somebody says, hey, how was your vacation? It rained while we were there. Well, it always rains in Hawaii, right? I mean, almost every other day it rained, but it doesn't rain all day long, and it didn't rain for the whole vacation. You know, things like prejudice and stereotyping, racism, these are all forms of overgeneralizing because you're trying to lump everybody into the same category. Now, one of the greatest examples of somebody that refused to overgeneralize would be that of Thomas Edison. Edison is not only the most successful inventor of all time in that he has more than a thousand different patents, 
Edison isn't just the most successful inventor, he's also the worst inventor of all time because he would apply for nearly 400 patents annually, all right? But the vast majority of them would get churned down. In fact, when asked about his failures, he said, I have not failed. I have found 10,000 ways that don't work, right? <laughs> so, you know, he had very high emotional intelligence. You know, other common irrational beliefs are when we focus on the negative while ignoring the positive. And if you tend to focus on the negative, now this would be, you're still on, maybe I heard some pages turn. You're still here where it says, what are the most common irrational beliefs? So if you focus on the negative while ignoring the positive, then most likely you're guilty and need to clean out your mental filters. Now, here's an example of somebody who needs to clean out their mental filters. So, that boss, remember I told you the boss who criticized you? Your boss praises the report that you turned in, but he wants you to tweak a couple of points. Instead of thinking about the praise that your boss just gave you, you're dwelling on the perceived. Leave that office. Your buddy says, well, how'd it go with the boss? He hated my report. He criticized it. Well, he pointed nine things out that he really liked and just said, can you tweak this one thing? And I think your report's going to be ready to go. So again, this is a mental filter that needs to get cleaned out. Another example is of a couple who starts dating. And during the infatuation stage, each person can only see the good in their romantic interest. You can always tell when a couple is in the infatuation stage because you ask them, can you tell me one habit or one thing about your significant other that you don't like? If they respond, oh, they're just perfect. Guess what? <laughs> they're in the infatuation stage. No, they're perfect. I love them, right? You think you like them, but again... You're in the infatuation stage. But eventually, this couple gets married. And that honeymoon period, right? Called the honeymoon period? That infatuation stage, what happens to it? In all cases, it what? Wears off, right? They start seeing the bad. And in extreme cases, all they focus on is the bad in that individual. So that prince has become a toad. <laughs> that princess has become a nag. Now, the goal with mental filters is not to be a pessimist. That's someone who's always negative. And it's not to be an optimist, right? Someone who's always positive. The goal is to have realistic optimism. Now, realistic optimism is where you expect the best, but you prepare for the worst. In fact, there's an example in the Bible of the Apostle Paul. By the way, the Apostle Paul had very high emotional. Out of everybody, out of anybody mentioned in the Bible, Jesus had the highest level of intelligence. You can see examples of those who had very low levels. I'll get to the story of Paul here in a moment. Guys like Esau, very low levels of emotional intelligence. Remember what he told Jacob? He said, I need to eat something or I'm going to what? And he sold his birthright to very low. What about King Saul, right? Remember how he was jealous of David because David had killed his ten thousands and Saul only his thousands. And King Saul had very low levels of intelligence. And there's other examples in the Bible as well. But one of the examples that I want to look at is the one of the Apostle Paul and Silas. And, and the Bible says that they were sitting in a dungeon cell when the phone began to ring. Right? Is that you, Pastor? Uh oh. No, the Bible doesn't say that. It says they were sitting in the dungeon cell, and rather than complaining, what did they do? They begin to sing praises to God. They begin to sing praises to God. Think about their situation. These guys had realistic optimism. So they're chained to the wall, right? They're sitting on what I imagine to be a hard, damp, uncomfortable floor. These men are, you know, shackled or whatever. I mean, they're just in a really bad situation. And yet they were willing to put their trust to God's. They begin to sing 
experiences. So let me ask you this morning, when you're in that, so to speak, dungeon of life, what are you going to do? Are you going to complain or are you going to sing praises to God? I like what Paul tells us here in the book of Philippians. He says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, do what? He says, meditate on these Again, the Apostle Paul had very high levels of emotional intelligence. Now, another irrational belief is called mind reading. Now, mind reading is a cognitive distortion that leads people to judge another person or a situation before they have enough details. For example, <clears throat> mind reading. You may, if you're, if you're a guy and you're in here, you've been married a long time, you may think, well, when it comes to mind reading, I know my wife can read my mind. Let me ask you, who do you think is better at mind reading, men or women? How many say women? Let me see your hands. How many say men? How many say it's a tie? It really is about a tie. They're really both about the same. Now, if you've been married to somebody for a very long time, they obviously know your personality. They know your habits, your quirks, your idiosyncrasies. And so, well, they can't read your mind. They still have a pretty good idea of, of who it is that you are because they know the patterns in your life. You know, I heard the story of a sailor that was traveling from Europe to America. And upon boarding the large ship, this sailor was informed that he would have to share a cabin with another passenger whom he didn't know. And after meeting this cabin mate, he went to the purser's deck and he asked if he could keep his valuables in the ship's safe. Speaking to the ship's purser, he said, you know, I really, you know, I probably don't do this, but judging from the appearance of my cabin mate, well, I don't think I can trust him. With a smile and a little chuckle, the purser replied, interesting enough, that passenger that you're going to be sharing a room with, he was just here in my office and he asked me to store his valuables for the very same reason. Right? They're judging somebody based upon what they look like. Now, the key to overcoming the cognitive distortion of mind reading is to never assume. We can't always know someone's intentions and the motives of others, so it's better to give people the benefit of the Does that make sense? I'm trying to, I've got a nine-year-old son, and this is something that I've been working with him on, is, you know, the idea that when another kid does something to him and it upsets him, the idea is, well, we don't know what the motives of that person were, right? We, don't, we can't read their heart. We can't read what their mind is thinking. And so to avoid mind reading, it's better to always give people the benefit of the doubt. To have this idea that when it comes to life, most people are trying to do the very best. We all fall short, which is why we need God's grace. But learning to give somebody the benefit of the doubt will help you to have more rational beliefs. And of course, our last irrational belief that we'll look at is that of fortune telling. Now, fortune telling is another cognitive disorder, and it occurs when people think they can predict things 100% of the time. They're accurate, even though the evidence doesn't support their catastrophic thinking. Now, an example of fortune telling error can be found in calamitous thoughts. For example, phrases like, my career is over and I know that I'm going to get laid off. Yeah. How do you know that? Yeah. I just know it's going to happen. My romantic life is over and I know that I'm always going to be single. I'm never going to find someone. Yeah. Yeah. Or this project uh, turned out horribly and I know my teacher is going to fail me. You know, the truth is, no one can know for certain that these events are going to come to pass. So what can you do when you find yourself with irrational thoughts, believing something is far worse than it is? When you have irrational thoughts and you think something bad is going to happen, you've got two options, right? I'm going to share with you the two options that you can do, and you tell me which of the two options, right? Here's option number one. The catastrophic event does not happen in which you worried and stressed about something that did not come to pass. Option one, waste all that energy. 
And I'm sure if you've got family or friends around you, they probably heard all about it, right? And then it never came to pass. Or number two, the catastrophic event does take place in which the undue worry caused you to experience the catastrophic event in your mind multiple times rather than just not only did you experience in your mind before it happened, then when it does happen, you experience it again. So the most helpful thing to do is to have realistic optimism, right? I'm going to hope for the best. I'm going to prepare for the worst. And I know that anything I go through in life, somebody else has gone through that, and they were able to come out on the side. Realistic optimism. Now, emotionally healthy individuals, here's the key. Those who have high levels of emotional intelligence, they learn to dispute their irrational thoughts and beliefs. You're going to want to write this down. I think it's in your notes. One of the best skills that anybody can learn in life is to challenge their irrational beliefs. One of the best things anybody can learn in life is I'm going to challenge. I'm going to challenge my irrational beliefs. Now, everything we're talking about when it comes to emotional intelligence, you know, that really takes place right here in the frontal lobe, which is interesting. Now, not to get too far off, off script here, but let me just um, digress for just a moment. In Bible prophecy, in the last days, the Bible says everybody's going to receive some type of mark in their forehead, right? You either got the mark of the beast of Revelation 13, or you have the seal of God of Revelation chapter 7. The main issue in the last days revolves around what happens right here. I firmly believe improving one's emotional intelligence, learning how to challenge irrational thoughts, will give the believer the greatest advantage possible to receiving the seal of God and not the mark. Does that make sense, yes or no? Because when you're having rational thoughts, you're saying, no matter what happens, I can put my trust in who? Right? No matter what challenge I'm faced with, I can put my trust in God. Because I know that this life right now is just temporary, and ultimately it determines where do I spend eternity. That, of course... We all want that to be heaven. So the goal of healthy individuals is to forcefully and deeply convince themselves that their self-talk statements that are causing them to feel so upset, not logical, not reality-based, and they're not. So learn to challenge your thoughts. Do you realize you'll spend more time talking to yourself than you will any other person on the So learn to challenge those thoughts that you're telling yourself. You know, Abraham Lincoln once said, the best thing about the future is that it comes one day at a time, right? Oh, amen to that. And of course, we see what Jesus tells us here in Matthew chapter 6. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let me share with you a little example in my life as we begin to wrap up this presentation here. You know, anytime I experience irrational thoughts, and there's times I experience irrational thoughts, I have found a pattern in my life. There's a pattern in my life. When I experience irrational thoughts, it's usually in those moments that I've taken my eyes off of it. You know that? And I'm either focused on myself and how I was mistreated, how I was wrong, me, 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 right? Or I'm focused on that situation and I'm telling myself irrational thoughts, stinking thinking, right? But when I have rational thoughts, it's those moments that I'm spending time in God's Word, like the book of Proverbs, will help you to learn how to have rational thoughts. And it's those moments that I'm focusing on Jesus instead of myself. You know, a great example is that of Peter. Remember the story of Peter when Peter walked on water? So Peter, you know the story. He gets out of the boat. He said, hey, if it's really you, bid me to come. And Peter is, that's how the King James put it. I don't think Jesus said the word. You know, but, you know, Peter starts walking on water. But as Peter is walking on water, he's looking at Jesus. 
But then he begins to have irrational thoughts. What did Peter begin to notice and think? But before he was thinking, what did he notice? Wind, right? Waves. The Bible doesn't say this, but I, knowing, you know, Peter's character, his personality, you know, he probably looked back and said, hey, look at me, guys, right? I mean, I just assume maybe Peter was that kind of person. You know, a talk first, braggart kind of guy. And he had irrational thoughts. That's when he begins to say, what did Peter do? Peter cried out to God, Lord, save me. Jesus reached down and saved him. You see, my point is this. If you're having irrational thoughts, do what Peter did and cry out to God and say, Lord, save me from my own irrational thoughts. Because when we learn to keep our eyes on Jesus, that's when we begin to have rational thoughts. And of course, we looked at this verse last night in the book of Jeremiah, for I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord. Think about this. God has thoughts. Do you think God's thoughts are rational or irrational? They're rational, right? And notice what he thinks about. Thoughts of peace, right? People with rational thoughts think thoughts of peace, not of evil. People with irrational thoughts focus on all the evil to give you a future and hope. In the rational thoughts of our Heavenly Father, he thinks about you thinks about you. And it's not thoughts of evil, but it's thoughts of peace. Remind yourself, when you're having irrational thoughts and you think the world's against you, God is for you. He's thinking about you. He wants you to experience peace. And you may have to reach up and say, Lord, save me. You see, the Bible promises that the future that God has in store for you is filled with hope. And I want to remind you that your past, whatever your past is, we all have a past, Right? Your past does not define who you are. I like to tell people it doesn't define you, it refines you. All powerful, loving God created you, and you are not some meaningless creation made by a disinterested creator. And God loves you. Here's the incredible thing. He doesn't have to love you. God does not have to love us. Often in my life, I am very unlovable. What about you? God does not have to love us, but he chooses. The Bible says here in 1 John 4, 8, it tells us God is love. God is love. I want you, when you leave this morning, I want you to remind yourself, and I want you to know, God is love. is absolutely crazy. Amen. Now, what I'd like to do is, I don't know, I just had kind of a quick thought. Let me first share with you the homework assignment. So on your homework assignment, on the, on the third page there of your lesson guide, it says, write down some of the negative and destructive behavior uh, feelings that happen to you. What are the situations that normally trigger these behaviors or feelings? You know, for most people, there's a pattern in their life that trigger these behaviors. Come up with a solution for each destructive negative behavior. For example, if you're feeling depressed, what are changes, sorry, what changes do you need to make in your life to help you better? So looking at those examples of irrational beliefs, have that hard conversation with yourself and say, are there any irrational beliefs that I'm doing? Why am I doing them? What triggers them? Is there a pattern in my life? By God's grace, how can I begin to think rationally instead of irrationally? And so let me ask you, would you rather um, spend 10 minutes here breaking up into our groups and going over our life groups, or because we have a fellowship lunch, and Pastor Jesse, if I'm wrong, it's on me, tell me, or those of you that stay for lunch around your tables, you could then have your discussion time in other words, do you want to eat now or do you want to eat in 15 minutes? Oh, okay. So normally we break into groups and we have a discussion here. So what you want to do is you want to bring this sheet of paper with you over to lunch. It's going to be lasagna and salad and bread. 
And you're going to sit, of course, at a family-style serving. You'll be at your table with, with those that you know. Or if you don't know somebody, go and meet them, sit next to them. But that's a good place to spend some time doing some discussion over this morning's message. Now, tonight, we'll be back in here at 7 p.m. to talk about how to build and maintain healthy relationships. We're off Sunday and Monday, but Tuesday's on parenting and Wednesday, how to win with Hey, I'm going to have a closing prayer, and I'm going to go ahead and just pray for the food as well. Can I do that? All right. Father God, we just want to thank you for today, Lord, and we pray that you would put that new mind, that you would renew our mind, the Bible says, and you would fill us with your spirit today. We all struggle at times with irrational thoughts. But I believe this morning, as we went through and talked about emotional intelligence, that, that you spoke to our hearts. You want us to have rational thoughts. You want us to live that, that abundant life that your son Jesus promised us. So Lord, help us to make that choice that we want to begin to have that conversation with ourselves. We want to begin to challenge those irrational thoughts. We want to think truthful statements based upon your word. Father, I want to pray for the food today, that you bless that food to our bodies. I pray also that you'll be with the conversations taking place around the tables. And we ask you to pray this in Jesus. If you forgot to scan in this morning, make sure you stop by the registration desk.